Hi, welcome everybody. This is Artist Talk on Art. Uh, today is April 12th, 2021. This is our 52nd talk, our 52nd response to COVID where we have not been able to get together and to meet at 12 West 12th Street. Uh, ATOA, Artist Talk on Art, is a nonprofit, a 501c3 that's been around since 1975. All our talks have always been on the Lower West Side. We've moved to this format. As soon as it's safe to go back, we will both go back to our location on the Lower West Side and we will continue doing Zoom presentations because we get people from Arizona. We've had presenters from Venice, Italy. We've had people from the United Kingdom and it's made it a lot easier for a lot of people to come and to gather. And so this is how we do it now, but we will continue. Um, we do, uh, Everything about us is listed on our website, atoanyc.org. You can find our calendar there. It'll tell you what's coming. We are actually booked through the end of July and I've started to book August talks as well. Um, on the other hand, if anybody would like to present, you're always welcome. You're not only welcome to present a talk and be part of a talk, but you're also welcome to organize a talk around a theme or not a theme and just put together three or four artists, reach out to me. You can find my information on the web um, as well. Feel free at any time to put any question, any comment, any statement in the chat, any information about your website or your Instagram, anything at all. What do we have tonight? Tonight, um, Susan Tiffin has organized photography, different perspective. She's brought together four artists, Eileen Novak, Thomas Demick, Alan Richards, and herself, Susan, who's also a photographer. Um, I wanna say thanks to Susan first and to the other three artists. As I like to say, our most valuable commodity is our time. That's the one we all have in limited supply. And I can't stress that enough, how grateful I am to see 39 people here this early as the talk hasn't started. And I appreciate all of you coming. Feel free to be interactive. Feel free to unmute yourself. I'm gonna hand it over to Susan. She'll give a brief introduction. And then we'll go from Eileen Novak, then to Tom Demick, to Alan Richards, and then back to Susan at the end. We'll take questions at any time at all. Feel free to talk about in the chat, any openings, any galleries you're a part, part of anything you want at all. So thank you, Susan, um, and welcome. And thanks for being a part of the ATOA, ATOA and organizing this. Well, thank you for having me and allowing me to organize it. Um, I, I don't remember exactly how I found out about the group, but I love the energy of it. And um, my thought in inviting the um, photographers that I invited was we all have a very different energy. Um, I'm probably the most conservative standard of the group. Um, you'll see Alan Richards with his vivid imagination and great sense of humor, Tom Demick with his gorgeous landscapes, and, um, and Eileen Novak Thomas. Eileen, I should ask you what you'd prefer to be called. Um, very bold graphic photography. Um, we are all very active in the photography groups on Long Island in various ways. And at the moment, we are all members of Photo Photo Gallery in Huntington, New York, uh, which is a great place. If, if you can visit, they have Zoom receptions, they have in-person receptions if you wear a mask and all that. And um, I just thank you all. And I, I thank my family for showing up because I just do. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, these artists will speak for themselves. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Eileen Novak, we'll jump right in with you. Welcome. Eileen, where are you coming in from? I'll ask you to unmute. Nice. Let me unmute. Okay. Yeah, I'm from uh, Long Island, out in the Suffolk County, Western Suffolk County, Deer town called Deer Park, just south of Huntington. So uh, 
And once again, I want to thank Susan for making me aware of your group and for inviting me. And it's fantastic. Um, I've looked at your website and everyone you've had in the past and coming up and some amazing artists you have who have had in the past and amazing ones coming up. I feel incredibly fortunate to be invited to talk and hopefully we'll do so. So, so a little bit about, my, about myself. I started <clears throat> as a commercial photographer back in the 70s. Quit that <laughs> after I had a big fire back in the 80s. Uh, and then dropped photography for almost 40 years. So got back into photography a while ago and I've been uh, just doing things that are fun for me to do. Not having to worry about commercial pressures or uh, any anything, just trying to please myself. So the, probably the best thing to do is to just me to share my website. I've just been putting together this new website. I can share that. Is that all right? Yes, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's there. Let's do that. Let me put that down there. Okay. So my photography has been doing, I've been doing a, a project called Common or objects, just plain ordinary objects over the past two years or so. And it's sort of about, I see things every day of photography or doing these gorgeous landscapes or looking at the details of nature, which are wonderful. Um, but I just felt that we needed something or some, sometimes someone has to look at the things that are commonly around us every day in our environment. And even the most common things have their own organic beauty or their own look to me. And I just wanted to see if I can get what I'm, share what I'm seeing with other people. And it sort of started with this image, which I, it was my ninth attempt at photographing uh, commodity scoops. And um, to me, this just, uh, I, I generally use this as the lead image for this project because it just says it, says it to me a lot that even the common things can be uh, very beautiful. And to me, this is always reminding me of a, uh, of a candle in a cathedral somewhere. And I'm just gonna go breeze through them here. Um, generally, this image is uh, you know, a common comb. I generally, and this isn't really, a, it's a, I generally try to take a straightforward approach with photography. I generally don't do composites. This is one of the rare ones where I did a composite. And I just called this comb over for fun. Eileen, let me ask you a question. Olga Alexander asks, what is a dye print? A dye print, okay. Well, photography, the modern photography printing, you can either do a, uh, there's two main methods of printing, either a pigment print or a dye print. A dye prints the older technology, more akin to a, a, a traditional photographic print that used organic dyes that would get absorbed into the paper. But they're not, and uh, recent technology is a pigment print, which is, uses paint pigments which sit on top of the paper. And that's generally considered more archival than dye prints. But they're dye prints for me because I like dye prints, I like the color, and I like the way they give. Uh, they harken back more to a traditional photographic image. Now, again, I'm looking at common things. People can guess what this is. I'm sure you know. Five seconds and four, three, two, one, it's up. Lipstick. Lipstick. <laughs> All right, it's just plastic straws, plastic straws. Okay. Again, obviously colored pencils. Again, one of my rare composites. I generally don't do composites, but if the image is just image was just screaming for me to do a composite, the point make the points point to each other. Again, these are wooden picnic sporks. Again, not really a composite. That's a straight shot, just with some blending in Photoshop to give the edge. And generally I'm working in a studio only, um, which I am in right now. And I generally have like a one meter square space to work. So anything I look at is gonna be a small object.
again, this just reminded me of looking under a microscope. Just screams paramecium to me. At the same time, even though it is that last one was a micro view, often I use the term macro micro where you get an object, it might be a small micro view, but you could see that as a as sort of a top down view of hills or a landscape or you know something like that. So sure. it, whenever you can get that play and the viewer is sort of seeing the connectedness between the very small and the very large, I think you've achieved something important in whether it's photography or painting. Sure, absolutely. The whole point of any visual artist to me is to look at things and share your own point of view about seeing things. And these scissors, while not probably a great art image, just stood out to me as like a, like a Star Wars movie poster, you know, standing out there. <laughs> I said, I'm doing things mostly for fun. It's a rainbow chart. So. It was launched later. This I did for an exhibition for a local uh, local group for an LGBT uh, art exhibit. And this one I just called One Red Balloon. There's a whole series of art looking at red balloons. Harkens back to me one of my favorite films from the uh, 50s, The Red Balloon. Uh that last one very much looks like watercolors and at the same time it looks like the women's breasts certainly the pink ones of course unless, unless that's what's on my mind i know but yeah well of course yeah well that's what water these are small water balloons again this is not a composite just a knife edge done with through multiple filters on different shots i just wanted to combine them all on the edge, nine edges. Again, common things. This was uh, children's toothpaste. This was a more fancy, a fancier spoon <laughs> reflecting itself. One of those multicolored spoons. And something we use every day. This just reminds me of a, a cathedral so much. The Cathedral of Ironing. This, I was at, I was photographing common things, and uh, one of these things was cellophane wrapper. And uh, I was very surprised that this came out of the cellophane wrapper I, had, I was photographing, and it just came out as a, uh, I see uh, like a mountain lion. Um, I do have a question, uh, Eileen. Some people would like you to speak to tabletop technique versus composites. Okay, well, as again, I'm not, I, um, I can't speak the composite too much because I only, I only do that rarely. Um, tabletop techniques, standard commercial studio stuff. It's uh, like this example here, it's a, uh, a cellophane wrapper suspended with a light coming from behind it, but with a black card in front of the light. It's called dark field. Uh, used also in a lot of commercial photography and also people who use microscopes. <laughs> do a lot of dark fields photography and they also do polarized. But this image just surprised the, really surprised me that it came out looking like an animal. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, in fact, Ali Berman says uh, the cellophane is beautiful, feels like it's a sea creature in the deep ocean. And I think Fran Beeler makes a good point. You're working with common things but they're seen uncommonly. And maybe you're opening up the sort of beauty inside the common and the sort of complexity and making us think to look again at common and simple objects in a new way. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. I mean, we have so many people out there taking these gorgeous landscapes, you know, and, and nature's beautiful. I love to see them, but I don't think I could do any better than the people are out there. I want to do, you know, I have stuff that, plus it's easier to, act, things around me are easier to access, especially under COVID. And uh, the surfaces, surface of thing and textures amaze me all the time. And this is just wrinkled foil. 
And this one was a result of me trying to do a series of a, uh, a spinning coffee cup. I was gonna to try to do a series of it and then do a uh, entire uh, collage basically of just multiple images in different places, but this didn't work out. <laughs> so, but this image came out at me and this I titled cold blue coffee because uh, I, use, I use a lot of mixed light. I use strobe and I use tungsten together, which is why you're getting the blue tinge on here from the strobe fills in the shadows blue. I just love the way this image feels to me. And the coffee was good too. And this is another one of my rare composites. Um, I was just playing around for fun with the cereal road. A well-known cereal. Ah, uh, oh yes. Well, apparently I have more composites in here than I for I'd forgotten about. So this was a, uh, a Band-Aid multiple times. Again, textures, I just love textures. This is a piece of, uh, I have a large piece of anthracite coal that my father gave me because he was a coal miner briefly as a child in Eastern Pennsylvania. And they always gave me this large chunk, it's about like a foot big to remind himself and I inherited it to where he came from. And, and again, we're just looking at toy balloons. I just love the way toy balloons look, especially in, uh, when transposed. And cocktail olives. I always really thought cocktail olives were cool. And we don't pay much attention to them. I thought I'd give it some attention. And it's like an eye staring at you. I do, again, want, to read, I do want to read a couple of comments, Eileen. Um, Waldrup, at least that's the name it's under, says these are amazing in person, printed on me metal or other substrates, some pretty large. Leah Paula says, unequivocal work, once seen and filtered by you, it stands solidly for what it is, nothing to add or take away. Um, Ali Berman asks, when you did the coffee cup, were you spinning it on a lazy Susan to get it go round? I was, the coffee cup was suspended on fishing line. <laughs> As I said, it was, I was trying to make it spin. I was trying to, I took about 300 photos of it spinning at various places. I was going to combine them into a, a single composite image of about 300 of them in different positions and maybe different colors, but that didn't work out. And this, this emerged. Sometimes when you try to do something, even if you pre-visualized it, you end up with something else. Sometimes you end up with what you plan to do. Sometimes you don't. I've said it before and I'll say it again. There's no extra credit for how long it takes you to make a great work of art. Ah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, a lot of photographers like to pre-visualize and I do too. Sometimes I have an image in mind. And I go down there and I set it up and I take three shots and that's it. It's done. This one, this one, for example. I mean, I, I knew what I wanted to do and I just did it and Nothing else came out of it, but again, I just love this as a homage to pop art. <laughs> uh, Jermaine Hodges says, um, I love your work, Eileen, very unique, reminiscent, a bit reminiscent of Jasper Johns and his contemporaries, but evolved, beautiful work. Uh, Larry says, your images remind me of the great photographers of the 60s and 70s. He mentions Hashi, Phil Marco, as well as many others, nice photo and glad you shared your art, not photos, oh. making reference to that. This is art, um, of course. And uh, uh, Peg Riley says the olives are amazing. You definitely have a way of going towards the abstract when you drill into these objects. Um, this one here has a, you know, this almost feels like a silver gelatin print. Um, I know. I, know. I, I love this spoon. This, is my, this has been a spoon that I've had for 50 years. So that's why it's bent a little bit, but I use it every day. And I think I wanted to make a beautiful picture of it. So I appreciate the comments, the good comments. I love Phil Marco's work. One of my great influences, Phil Marco, commercial photographer from the, uh, who innovated softbox technique back in the 70s. Um, also, you know, those great commercial photographers from before, Bert Stern, Avedon's commercial work, 
Irving Penn's commercial work. Always great. I'd love to be uh, even have a fraction of their uh, <laughs> of their talent. Uh, again, uh, just for fun, multicolored bagel. Again, I I'm, have too many composites here, more than I thought. And we're back to the end on this one. Um, I can show a bit from the next, the newer series that I'm doing here. If we have time. Yeah, go ahead, show us, show us a little bit and then we'll move on to the next artist, but yes. Yeah, sure, sure, of course. The next one I have, I have a solo show coming up at Photo Photo Gallery and it's gonna be this one called Form and Texture. Um, again, I've been a member of Photo Photo Gallery for almost two years and they've given great opportunities. So, so I was also uh, lucky enough last year to be uh, part of the Heckscher Museum in Huntington's Emerging Artist Series, which was really fantastic as well. So this one is mostly on form and texture. I'm trying to get away from color and go toward more uh, monochrome. So most of these are monochrome. And this just, I wanted to just wanted to look at through the, through a tulip, not at a tulip. Again, that's a same one from the before. Again, setting up simple, simple black and white noticing and form and the texture. Again, push pins, I just love the texture they create it. Eggs are always an all consuming passion. They're such a basic and such a basic form, you know, and everything. I, I, I tend to have too many egg pictures. <laughs> now the broken, broken shells. I call these, you know, like the aftermath or afterbirth. And this is just uh, the energy that comes from the core of an apple. I, I just trying to depict that. And I have it in color, but I, I like it more in black and white. That's a, that's a beautiful image, that really is. You really yeah. play with light very well. You really well, do. Yeah, thank you so much, because I, I certainly try. Uh, photography is all about how light plays with, uh, with objects around us. Again, this is the, the result of uh, using those shells. So this is also broken shells. The texture of common things always fascinates me. And this is uh, tin. This is a common tin can. So I just love the texture of it. Uh, texture again, texture, texture in a uh, cloud of soap, <laughs> basically soap foam and the way light filters through it. I just found that interesting. Ah, a very simple image of uh, a craggy fruit. <laughs> again, um, this is more of a homage to Phil Marco, by the way, <laughs> except they don't have the, uh, the uh, egg on it or the, a fly sitting on it which he would typically do. Again, it's texture and the way light goes through these. This was a common, this was a piece of packaging material I had gotten somewhere. <laughs> I forgot, I don't think I have it anymore. Again, I go back to eggs. I do, I, want to read, I do want to read a few comments. Jermaine Hodges says, this is very inspiring, thank you. Uh, Basha, Ruth Nelson says, I love these. They really make you see the image. And I, I think she's, she's hit the nail on the head. We are seeing these common objects in a new way. Uh, Joan, Joan DeRosa, nothing is ordinary as you have shown me. Uh, Allie Berman, can't have too many egg pictures. And I'd have to agree, you know, as an artist, I sometimes draw the same landscape for 10 years and it's sure. never the same drawing. So you know, what you choose to look at will always be different. Um, and the artwork you make will be different. Olga Alexander says, I love the colored prints and the pop art they reference. Uh, uh, Robin Halpern, love your work, great eye, especially the black and white images. Can you mention again where you'll be showing your work? And someone asked, what camera do you use? Oh, okay. Well, I appreciate all the wonderful comments. I, I much greatly appreciate it, believe me. Uh, I'm not, you know, so eggs, I agree. You can't have many pictures of eggs. I see eggs every day. So, <laughs> so I, I, 
I don't know if I have more. In terms of uh, equipment and cameras, that was the last one in this series. Um, but uh, I use various cameras. I mean, uh, I started with a Sony A6000 doing this series with an old, uh, let's see if I have it. Uh, yep. I started with an old A6000 with a old Russian lens on it <laughs> that I got in a thrift store. That was the scoop picture was taken with this lens, $5 lens. So equipment doesn't matter much. Um, I've, I've morphed over to a Nikon Z7 last year. So I morphed over to that. But other than that, equipment doesn't matter. We just had some great exhibits at Photo Photo. Let me stop sharing my screen. Um, we just had some great exhibit, uh, your best shot of Photo Photo, where one of the winning images was taken with a pinhole camera. A great series the woman is doing with a pinhole camera. So uh, equipment doesn't really matter. It's the image that matters. And thank you so much for letting me talk. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. I do want to read a few more comments. Um, uh, Eloise Pomfret says, beautiful work. Uh, Alan Richards points out what is striking to him is the absolute contrast between black and white. And I will add, I, I like the early work that you showed, but the last series with the black and white uh, really moved me uh, even more so, uh, really seemed to stand out. Uh, I think you hit your stride there. Um, um, I will say when you showed, when, when you talk about common images, and I was glad you, you did, I think, something like your toothbrush or something like uh, toothpaste you used. What comes to mind is Magritte's famous painting, where Magritte did a painting of his uh, uh, cabinet in his bathroom, his medicine cabinet. And he was purposely doing the common objects that he sees every day and sort of the surreal importance these objects have. And I think you're you're living in his vein, the value of that spoon, having you having held it and used it for 50 years, I'm not surprised that was one of your more striking photographs because you're bonded, you're connected, you're connected to those objects. Um, and yeah, I, I think beautiful work, great presentation. If anybody would like to comment, feel free to jump in now. Otherwise we will move on to Tom Demick, but um, certainly everyone has put lots of nice comments in uh, the uh, chat, but feel free. Yeah, go ahead, uh, uh, Waldrop, I think. It, it's Pamela. Uh, I just wanted uh, to ask, uh, I mean, great job, awesome. I know your work is awesome. Uh, just please uh, let people know when your show is coming up at Photo Photo Gallery so they can come and see it because it's gonna be awesome. Well, you can know, you, it's made- you put it in the chat? Yes. Can you put it yeah, sure. I can put it in the chat. I'll, I'll have to Thank look it you. up though. I, don't, I keep forgetting the, the main dates. It's like May 4th through May 26th or something like that. Right. Very soon with that reception date to be announced. We didn't announce a reception date for it yet. And I appreciate everyone's nice comments. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Eileen. Larry, I think you have uh, something you wanted to ask or say. Well, I, I'm so pleased that you love Phil Marco. Um, Phil Marco was a uh, photographer who I worked with many, many times during the heyday of the ad business. One of his great images is a kind of a combination of your images. The wonderful iron that you did, the iron that you did standing upright, Phil had an image like that with an egg, a fried egg cooking on it. Uh, yeah, image. that's that's classic Phil Marco putting an egg on a on a glove or something else. I right. love him. I loved his images when I first saw them in the Black Book in the '70s, and yeah. uh, I just took a online class from Don Gianetti last last year, and he also did a whole video on uh, Phil Marco's work. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people appreciate Phil Marco. Yeah, great, great, great. great. Thank you again, Eileen. And by the way, we can always come back to other questions or thoughts about uh, Eileen and her work. We are going to move on to Tom Demick. I do want to remind everybody, this is Artist Talk on Art, ATOA. Our website's atoanyc.org. All of our talks are free. 
you'd like to contribute, there's information on our website. There are many different ways to contribute to what we do. And again, we appreciate everybody being here. We have a nice group of 49 uh, artists and friends together. And do, if you like what you see here, spread the word. We've certainly infiltrated New York Artist Circle and we have many members of New York Artist Circle that join us. Maybe the next thing is this, uh, wait, um, this group photo photo gallery. Maybe you spread the word and more of them join us and this way we sort of grow our hive. So Thomas, I wanna welcome you. Let us know where you're coming in from. I'll ask you to unmute. Um, and uh, I wanna thank Thomas. He has become sort of a part of our group here, joining in many times in the last few months. It's, it has been very interesting. It's, I've learned a lot. It has been very inspiring. All right, I'm gonna try and share my screen. And I guess, hold on. How come it's not though? That's all right. Oh, I have to just hit share. There you oh. go. There you go. We actually worked on yeah. this midweek. Thomas, you right. know. Tell us a little bit about, I know you sort of came to photography late in life. You had a another career. And I, am I right? You've been- a I did. Yeah, I go through this in, a, uh, in the presentation. I'll get to all those questions. Okay. All right. So- Thank you for having me. It's, as I said, it's been very interesting being part of the group. And just 30 seconds about myself, pre-photography. Pre-photography is the bulk of my life, actually. I was brought up in Brooklyn, but I spent summers in Greenport, New York. Uh, my parents bought a little cottage for $6,000 uh, in 49 in Greenport and I spent all my summers there. And I think that really influenced my photography because I would spend hours on the beaches, hours in the woods, just contentedly just sitting in a forest. And then after I graduated uh, from college, I, I started teaching. I was a teacher for, oh, I was in 38 years in the same school in Bushwick in Brooklyn. I taught very young children, pre-kindergarten to grade five. I taught science, which was a lot of fun and very creative. But I always had a yearning. I always needed an aesthetic outlet in my life. And one thing that was a constant throughout my whole life was gardening. Uh, that's my backyard in the house in Glenhead, where I lived sort of full time. So. I always had gardening, but finally, retirement came. I retired at the age of 60. I consulted uh, for the department uh, for about three or four years. I was training teachers. I was selecting science libraries for the city. I taught a graduate course in a college that I could never get into myself. And finally, I turned around and said, what is wrong with this picture? I'm doing three and four full day presentations a week. And this is not what I wanted to do when I retired. I wanted to start a hobby where I could, I want to take pictures. And that's basically what I did. So for the last nine years, I've been taking photographs. I'm basically self-taught. I've been to, I don't know what self-taught actually means. I've been to workshops, I go on YouTube, I, I learn, I look at other artists' work, I read books, but by definition, I'm self-taught. I have no formal education in art, except for landscaping design. Oops. I like the fact that my work is evolving. I've only done this for nine years. And I also enjoy the fact that I look at some of my first images that I took eight, nine, seven years ago, and I kind of cringe. And I think that's a healthy thing because I want to keep getting better. My work is basically representational, but uh, it's also interpretive. I don't really talk about the narratives that much. 
I leave that up to the viewer to, to understand what I'm doing. As you can see, this is, there is some interpretation here. I'm primarily a landscape photographer, but I do love to do other projects. I was in Scotland two years ago, up in Glencoe, and I was with a group. The rest of the group is photographing a sunrise off, you know, epic. It was gorgeous with the mountains and the lock and the whole thing. But I went off by myself, as I usually do. And there was this woman who was a wife of one of the other photographers. And I said to her, I'll buy you a drink at dinner if you'll bottle for me. So she laughed. I bought her a uh, tonic at, at dinner. And I told Dan here, walk there. And this is the image that I wound up with. Tom, maybe uh, try coming a little a bit, Tom, maybe try coming a little bit closer because oh, we're okay. getting a breakup when you speak. That's is it. that better? Yes, yes. Okay, I'll lean forward then. Uh, this is out in Joshua Tree National Park. You know, I've seen so many pictures of Joshua Forests, Joshua Tree Forests, and they were all black and white. They're beautiful, but I want to come up with something of my own. So this is in the pouring rain. I added some texture. I had that nice rock out cropping in the back. And I made something I think that is, is more me than just a, a typical black and white Joshua Tree image. This is out in Utah along a dirt road a few years back. More Utah, this is in Capitol Reef. Can you move I've your cursor? I've been always impressed with Thomas Moran. Can you move sure. your cursor? Oh, thank you. It's moved. Uh, Thomas, these are all very painterly photographs. How are you achieving this? I mean, you know, you're getting this, uh, uh, the, the photographer, his name is eluding me. Uh, one of the early photographers, um, It'll come to me. He did the uh, the story of man, Steichen. You have a you have sort of a Steichen feel. How are you getting this? You know, I started adding textures to my work very subtly. I don't want to overpower the image with the texture, but. I always, even before I start, even when I first started taking photographs, everybody always said my work is very painterly. It's, I guess it's just the way I see things. I get more inspiration from photographer than from painters than I do from other photographers. It's beautiful work. Thank you. Uh, again, in Utah, down some dirt road that takes a whole day to go through out on the Oregon coast, I saw the little boy and the father and it reminded me of my son back on Long Island 45 years ago when he was that, that size. I do want to read a few comments. Uh, Susan sure. Griffin points out these look like paintings. Um, Basha Ruth Nelson, the atmosphere you create in your photos has a magical quality. And I think she hit the nail on the head. You know, you're you're out in landscape, but you're either we're not seeing the normal magic in landscape, or you're just able to sort of bring it out. Um, there's no question about it. These are quite beautiful. Um, uh, Mark Josloff says, when you say, what is me, more than simply a photo of the Joshua tree, what is you, do you think? Very good question. How would, how would you say this is yourself in these photos? I rephrase his question. You know, I don't like to think about things, overthink things too much. And what is me is up to you to figure out by just looking at it. A lot of people say there's a sense of solitude in my photos. Uh, this is the way I visualize things when I'm seeing it. I don't, I, I guess I'm a moody guy. I love moods. So. I hate to interrupt. Anyway, this is. Hello, can you move your cursor off the image? I find it a distracting detail. Thank you so much. Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, I, second time you had to tell me that, I no, apologize. Yeah, but they're so beautiful, so I notice it. So thank you very much. Okay, 
So this is in Cedar Key, Florida. Cedar Key is not part of the Florida Keys. It's up on the West Coast, way up. And I was searching, I was in Florida one winter, as I am most winters, uh, looking at Google Maps for places to photograph. And I noticed this town, it's the nearest supermarket is 20 or 30 miles away. It's surrounded by nation, national wildlife preserves. So I went there two years in a row. The first year I went every morning, every evening, took naps during the day when the light was bad, didn't get a good one good picture. I went back the second year and I started to understand it photographically. And I was able to get quite a few pictures that I do like. Elena Forrest points out, uh, your photos have a sepia cast. Uh, um, I do play with the tones and the colors. You know, it's, oops, get that out of the way. Uh, uh, Robin, Robin Halpern points out, your images harken back centuries, beautiful and mystical, great compositions. And I think Carol Arita picks up on that such a peaceful, calm eye. And I think you are reflected in this because I've seen you a few times now and the sort of the calmness and the peace that, that are in just about all of your photos, it's actually in your face and your way that you hold yourself. Well, um, you I know, hate to admit it. I'm calm when I'm taking photos. I'm not a very calm person otherwise. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. just me. Uh, okay. Joe Joan DeRosa says, this is a William Sidney Mountain or Mount. Um, and Audrey Anastasi says, what do you mean that you add texture in Photoshop? Uh, well, I use a program, it's a Topaz program and it comes with a bunch of overlays that you can overlay textures on top of your image. So with this image, I might have put six or seven or five different textures, but I try and do it so it doesn't cover up the photo. It doesn't detract from the photo. Like I didn't really put much uh, texture in the sand. It's mostly concentrated in the sky. So I don't want my textures overwhelming. And it just, you know, as I said, I'm very unsophisticated. I don't have a art background. And I, it was kind of funny. I was in an art gallery in Naples, Florida, and I'm looking at this woman's work, these landscape paintings, and I had an epiphany. I said, you know, painters use texture. And I said, gee, you know, I think I always thought textures were horrible. And I said, I'd never use textures. I thought they were too kitschy, uh, just, you know, schlocky, but I started using them. Well, anyway, this is Long Island, and I do photograph around my homes on Long Island. I don't have to go to these epic places. Thomas, I, I have to cut in and say, you may not have an art background, but you definitely have an art foreground. Thank you. Well, I'm caught at it. I'm learning as I'm going. Uh, I, you know, I did, I like to garden, so it's that everything ties into each other in your life. This is in uh, Sunken Meadow, just a, a state park here on Long Island. And a lot of times I'm out photographing. I have this big, heavy tripod and a very serious looking camera. And I was like, what are you photographing? And my answer is, you know, trees and weeds. And Basically, and then I would joke around with them. I say, you know, that's why we're here for the trees and the weeds and it's gorgeous. And another thing I know, I get, as I said before, I get more inspiration from uh, painters than I do from photographers. And I always notice that painters can paint any old thing, any old tree, any old weed, and they make it look stunning. So I'm trying to do the same thing. More I, trees think, and weeds. I think you're, you're achieving it, Thomas. You definitely are. You. I just recently watched, I think it was net, on Netflix, a sh uh, something called The Gardener about a gentleman in Quebec who developed a garden 
for about 50, 60 years called, I think it was Catravan. And he was a gardener, but when you watched him and you heard him speak, you realized he was an artist. And his approach to his garden was he would do something and then he'd listen. And that would let, let, him, let him to what he did next, which is a method many artists do. They listen to the work for direction. So I think the line between gardening, understand Monet spent a lot of time at G. Right. Renee planting flowers. There is a fine line. Um, sometimes artists feel the canvas isn't enough, it's static. And they go right. out into the land and they create line, form, texture, contrast, in gardening. So I think it, it definitely, you're definitely uh, suited coming from landscape work. And, uh, you know, having seen the garden that you did, you know, that, that was some garden that you showed, that you created. Yeah, I found it a bit hard. I thought it was going to be a very easy transition between landscaping and photography, but it isn't because in landscaping, you move everything around. Photography, you have to find what you like. more trees and weeds that's out in towards Orient Point way on the uh, North Fork of Long Island. Now this picture is interesting. Uh, I took this many years ago, about seven years ago, and I thought it was the greatest picture because I had to excuse the cursor. I had a mass here, a mass here, this dead tree, these shrubs hanging down into the water, the water running through the composition and the distant mountains that you can hardly see. But I got home and I was so disappointed. And then during COVID last, this winter, the COVID, the winter of COVID nightmare, I started going through a lot of old photographs and I finally understood what to do with this picture. And this was it. And I realized it's like the colors were just so beautiful that morning. They were distracting. They weren't allowing you to see the landscape. And this is what I got. Oh, so your, your point, I, Tom, your point that color can be distracting. Certainly uh, the first presenter, Eileen, when she removed the color so she could focus on form and texture, you know, there's, there is some strength in right. by removing color. Our eye can be dazzled by Disneyland and it could take away from something. I do want to read, uh, Jenna Lash says, um, your love of the land comes through in your painterly work. Larry says, the pictures we see transpose us. I feel viewing these so privileged. Um, and uh, I know your name's not Waldrop. I'm sorry for calling you that. But uh, you say, one of the things I love most about your work, Tom, is that you're not an intruder. You become a part of the environment without imposing yourself. Eileen Novak comments, beautiful classic images, Tom. And Susan Tiffin, love, love, love the sunken meadow. A uh, question asked, I was curious, what size do you print? Um, what size do you usually uh, show the work at? I don't print big. I have a 17 by 22 inch printer. When I grow up, I wanna buy a big printer because I think my work would look really great big but that's something to look forward to later in life although i'm 74 so i gotta act fast no, it's good all to right color. so i do color yes let's just let's just do a few more because uh i all right i'm gonna run late i do why don't i just up. show and not talk all right uh, okay I'm going fast. Just a little bit more time, just, you know, an extra five seconds on each. Sure. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm doing. This is out in the shipyard in Greenport. They were tearing down a power plant. And thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas. Okay. I'm going to stop the screen sharing so everybody could see. Hey. Wow.
round of round applause. Of applause. <laughs> Claps and snaps. <laughs> I'm just going to jump in because Tom didn't say this. He has a solo show coming up, too. <laughs> so, it's going to be exciting to see his work. Where? At Photo Photo Gallery. Sorry. Ah. Very nice, Thomas. That beautiful work. Very moving. You know, Thank at, you. at times you think art is about, you know, it's, it can be as simple as trying to capture beauty whether it's the beauty in the common objects that Eileen did or beauty in landscape. Um, however, it's not so common and easy and it takes a sort of, uh, it takes an artist to capture what you captured. Those are very unique photos. Uh, I think it's great that you're still evolving and changing. And I think it's important to have goals, whether it's to print larger, that's sort of how we cheat death. We know we're not done. We have things to do. And so it sort of motivates us to keep living. I've heard time and time again from very mature artists in this group who have been out of college for many decades say, this is my new work. I've just developed that. And I think that's what keeps us artists going. Uh, I think maybe the, the worst curse for an artist could be static and still in what you're doing, but to evolve change and maybe say, okay, I did that. What's next? It also, it gives us a reason to get up. And they found uh, people who live long, they have a reason to get up in the morning. It's a very important thing. So I want to thank you. I do want to move on because I don't want to be too late tonight. And I want to go to Alan Richards. If anybody has any comments or questions, feel free to just yeah. uh, pop them in uh, the chat. Barry, am I muted? Um, you, I'll move up. You want me to mute you, Thomas? Yeah, Barry, I have to sign out and sign in again because I lost uh, the connection. All right, so just. Okay, I'll let you back, back in. No problem. No problem. Uh, once again, I'll repeat we're Artists Talk on Art. We're a 501c3. Right. You could visit our That's website. Free. You could visit our website, ATOA nyc.org. We have a YouTube channel. This will be captured. I'll put it up either Tuesday or Wednesday, and you can revisit this talk. Um, you can see our calendar if you go online. Our website is complete. There are links for our talk. And again, spread the word. If you like what you're seeing here, tell a friend. If you want to contribute, feel free to contribute. If you want to organize a panel, organize a panel. Reach out to me. We'll make it happen. We've got some great talks coming including some more talks by people who write about how to get your art exposed and things like that. And of course, our focus is really often artists just talking about art, just like our name says. So let's go to Alan Richards. And thank you again, Thomas. That was brilliant. Oh, it's very good. Thanks. Man. You hear me? Okay. We can hear you. Welcome, Alan. And where are you coming in from? I'm coming in from uh, Roslyn, uh, North Shore of Long Island. And um, let me just be on my screen here and see if I can do this. Yeah. How come I can't do this? Oh, hold on. You see? Yep, well done. Okay. Um, all right. I'm, <laughs> I'm really impressed by my. Uh, by my uh, photo photo uh, fellow artists. I, uh, I know Tom very well, but I hadn't seen Irene's work and it really is impressive, which leads me to me. <laughs> um, I'll give you a little bit about me. Um, I'm not, I, I wasn't trained as an artist, obviously, <laughs> but my, uh, I grew up in a, a house full of artists. I was born in the Bronx, as you might tell. Uh, and uh, my father was a commercial artist, one of the madmen, and that's how I grew up. And my mother was uh, from the Art Students League. She was a, uh, a uh, an oil painter. So having a father who was in uh, a commer commercial artist and a freelancer, I immediately didn't want to go into art. Uh, it was a rough. It was a rough deal. Um, Anyway, so I became an audiologist of all things. And um, 
got a PhD from CUNY and taught at CUNY for a number of years and also practiced audiology, mostly in Manhattan for uh, about 30 years also on the Upper East Side. Um, so I never really had an, uh, I had an interest in art, but I never pursued it as a, as a, as a career. But along the way, I was doing a lot of drawing and as you can see from the back of me, uh, I was involved in planes and modeling of the uh, things. So I did a lot of stuff. And about 10 years ago, I decided to uh, start doing artwork, whatever my artwork was going to be. And uh, so my artwork uh, turned out to be um, more a conglomeration of uh, photography, of drawing, and compositing, and so on. So uh, let me just see now. How can I make it? So uh, this is, I can show you, this is one image, it's called the uh, coffee break. And uh, again, it's, everything you're going to see here is a composite. Uh, and um, let's move on. So what I do is, uh, are these uh, photographic composites, and sometimes it's called uh, new media art. Uh, it's sort of an evolving thing. It's all of a sudden I see my work is uh, fitting into what are called NFTs. Have you been reading about that recently? The new uh, digital uh, digital crypto currency. I'm trying to keep myself there. Anyway, but my images, you, I use uh, vintage images. I use segments of uh, TV images. I use clip art. I use computer aided uh, drawing. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is um, create an overall image using all those factors. And um, a, lot of these, a lot of these images, I like to talk about how, what is the human condition. I see myself as a, a product of New York City and a really, um, I'm very proud of it. And I think it comes through in my art. So let's move on a bit. So this is a picture. I just uh, actually just finished it yesterday. And uh, it's, you can tell it's a composite. It's called Life, uh, the Game of Fate. And what I tried to do with this particular, like what it is initially was a pinball machine which I took a picture of. And I altered some of the, some of the, uh, the writing on the pinball machine but everything else that I, I put in. In other words, I wanted to have in this particular picture, people who were basically younger, but ultimately contributed a lot to the world as we know it. Now, some of these people met terrible fates and others didn't. So fate, again, the life is fate to a great extent. So for example, um, I have uh, Anne Frank, she didn't live very long, but she certainly had an impact. I have Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I have, uh, well, I'm, I'll move my cur cursor around just to show I have a uh, uh, guy from uh, North Korea, fun, whatever. I have, uh, I have the Obamas, young Elvis, not bad Elvis, I have young. Uh, Giuliani, not the Giuliani that we have these days, and a lot of other people that you might might or might not recognize. Uh, John Lennon as a young man, uh, Princess Di, and uh, Trump even as a younger man, not as the Trump we know him now. And that's uh, that's one picture. So that's the type of thing I do. I try and talk to the, somehow to the human condition. Uh, and I try to stay away from repetition. So every picture that I do uh, turns out to be something else. So here's another picture I did a few years ago called The Swimmer. And I get my inspiration from a lot of different things. And I'll go through that a little bit later on. I got this uh, inspiration from this, from an old famous picture of uh, Weeki Wachi. Um, there was a lady who was swimming in a you know, gown and so on. But this is actually a, uh, 
a figurine. And she was playing volleyball at the time. And I took the picture in, in Florida. She was in a, in a, in a case. And uh, so that, that uh, she became the swimmer. And um, Larry, I believe that you had seen this picture down at the Manhattan Art Center when uh, that's who was there at that time. Here's another one I just finished. That I really enjoy the work of certain artists. And one of the, the people I uh, really enjoy is Edward Hopper. And I like the mood that he, that he uh, generates. So uh, this uh, picture is called the Midtown Reverie. The, the people were the, and of course she's wearing a mask, but the, the, that's just clip art with the people and I stretched them out and, and uh, I drew the, uh, uh, physically drew the, uh, uh, the boots and I tried to create a mood. And if you look out the windows, it's raining outside and, He's seeing her reflection and he's having coffee. There's a uh, you know, the mask on the table and they're just not communicating with each other. That's and this uh, I really enjoy the work of Hopper and that this particular image gives me that feeling. I hope it gives you too. Um, this is another type of image. I just actually this image uh, they did. I just saw an article today about this image in a, in a newspaper called the Connecticut Post. Because uh, this image is, is featured at uh, there's a museum in, in uh, North, North Walk, Connecticut called the Lockwood Matthews uh, Museum. And this picture is presently there. And it's called On the Edge. It was done in, uh, it was done during lockdown. And basically, and it's funny, I never really thought about this particular image. It, it's, it's, it's drawings and, and clips and um, a little see a head. And I never really looked at it. Uh, but in today's paper, that, well, I got to, they were talking about this as a Calder type of an image. And I sort of agree with them. I never really, I never really thought of it as a cold image, but it's kind of interesting. So. You can certainly see how it almost reads as a mobile as yes. a mobile. Um, uh, I did want to read from the uh, quotes. Uh, Tricia Wright says, love the ethereal quality of the swimmer, one of the earlier images. Right. Uh, Basha Ruth Nelson says, you've created a mood and a story. You definitely have a narrative here, no question about it. And uh, Ali Berman points out the balance is like a Calder, good point. And mm -hmm. Eileen Novak, very cool, Alan, and certainly comments like that work. I do want to read an earlier comment that I missed. Mark Josloff said, an artist does not capture beauty, but rather projects beauty, even when it is not originally visible. And I think that's a very important point, sort of lines up with what we've said in the past, that it's, uh, it's not the camera that you use, that's just a tool for an artist. It's really your eye, your choices, and your vision. And, you know, so far, the three artists that have presented, you're all photographers. You could not be farther apart on the spectrum. And it just goes to show you there are many different ways to play the game. And yes, there are rules in art, but you set the rules. And you've all set different rules for yourself, and you're all successful at it. Um, in very unique ways. So keep going, Alan. I, I just wanted to you know, get yeah. them in. Um, also, Eileen Novak points out very Escher in the Impossible Planes. MC Escher, certainly everybody was a fan of him when they you know, first got into art. And Escher is having his day again. Um, he was sort of looked over by history, but art history is going to give him another look. Um, Fran Beeler, Alan, you also have a painterly kind of vision. No question, the ones that you, the, the uh, setting in the diner, very painterly, um, yeah. but in a very different way than your colleagues. And, you know, Fran has hit the nail on the head. It's a very different kind of painterly photograph. Well, can I, I interject something um, just quickly? The reason I invited the people I invited was because 
they definitely all have a different point of view, each a unique type of artist photographer. I'll shut up. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the comments. And it's an interesting thing, and I, I've told this a million times to other people. When I first started doing this, I didn't even realize, I didn't recognize that it was art. In, in fact, I told this, I, I'm sorry if I'm telling you the same thing over here. I, I, as an audiologist in Manhattan, I had a patient of mine who's passed on since then. His name was Erwin Ir Pouster, and he was the head of fine arts department at Parsons. And I literally asked him, Erwin, is this art? And I, I, and I was serious. And he said, oh, yeah, it's art. And um, he wasn't using the tools that are available to do that. And then he went into a whole, whole long thing. So I'll move on here. Okay, <laughs> this is uh, this is a picture called Tar Beach, and this goes to my roots. And uh, since uh, we were never able to uh, to get to the Hamptons, uh, we went to Tar Beach. Now, this picture was uh, based on actually uh, people from uh, from Aruba. I had gone to Aruba. I'm taking all these pictures, and the building was from uh, East 82nd Street during Hurricane Sandy. We were forced to move to East 82nd Street to, my, to uh, a family member's apartment. And so the building was across the street. And um, so I took this picture, but not took the picture, it's a, it's a composite obviously, it doesn't exist. And uh, so you see here all these, each individual here is a, a pic, is a person from, from uh, Aruba, and the little water tower over here is a, from my train set and so on. And this guy over here, he would sort of come to the window across the street from my office on 89th Street, and uh, he would sort of just pose for me every, every couple of days. I have all sorts of pictures of him, a little, little wacko, but anyway, he was a good, good photographer. So, uh, this picture is done very well. And it was a Sal Gundy, by the way. I know you're at 12th Street, so Sal Gundy was on 12th Street. This actually won, uh, I think, the first, one first prize in uh, the Alan, Alan, uh, Robin Halpern says, very creative, thought out, and executed works. No question as to whether your work is art. <laughs> um, very nice. And uh, uh, one artist would like you to mention the size of your works and some of your sculptural interpretations. Oh, nothing, nothing short of fantastic. Thank you. Uh, this is this particular my image is off to about 50 uh, lengthwise, and uh, 50 by 50 would be the largest I would do. Uh, I generally print the uh, uh, 17 by 25 here, and anything else goes out, you know, to that. Into the, into the world. But these are fairly substantial pictures. Uh, okay, here's another one. I, I go all over the place. I, mean, I, don't, um, I like the Greek very much. So every once in a while, I'll get them a Greek. I'll do it. You know, so I don't know. When I start, it starts off as one thing and it ends up another thing. By the way, if I'm taking too much time, let me know. Uh, you, you, you're doing fine. Okay. These uh, these kids were uh, from Coney Island in 1905. That's where I lifted them from, and I built the walls so using the. No, I drew the walls, drew the, the sky. I had I didn't know what the kids were doing; they were just standing around. So I gave them, so I gave them kites, which really turned out to be great. And I didn't know how to get the kites up in the air without hitting the wall, so I went through the walls with portholes. And, so this picture of and it's called stagnation because these kids are sitting there since 1905. And you'll notice that they're just in, in water. I, I put that water in there. Just to go. They're not going any place so far. And uh, this picture is about 50, about 50 wide. And uh, it, it, it's, it works out well. Alan, uh, one thought, uh, Eileen Novak says, love your composites and your sense of humor. <laughs> and you, there is definitely a sense of humor that comes out in these works. I'll say, 
I've been recently, I've been doing collage. There's a collage feel to this work. And I guess that's, you know, because you're combining, whether it's clip art or digital art, you're sort of playing and putting, piecing together uh, yeah. your photographs. Uh, Olga Alexander asks, talk about your process. And I'm curious, I guess, what do you start with? How does it evolve? Um, what are your tools in your toolbox? Uh, and how do you approach the beginning, maybe? That's the well, way. Well, for, uh, it's hard to tell you how I approach it. I, basically, I look for people. You'll notice that all my, all my images have people in them. I don't have any images. I look for people who are happy within them or seem content within their own souls. In other words, I'm, they, they're a little outside the, the norm, but yet they're not sick. You know, I'm not a street photographer. I don't go looking for people laying you know, in hallways and things like that. I look for people who are going about their business, ordinary people, and that's where I start. And then I'll say, well, I have these ordinary people. Now, where can I put these people? And that's where the process takes me in, in any direction. Some, some are easier than others. This, I had all these kids, they were all bunched together, and I pulled them apart. How I came up with this image, I don't know. <laughs> I have to be, it just evolves. Some, some much easier than others. This one, I, I like, I, when I was doing this one, I, I had pictures of walls, and I was saying, how can I merge these kids into these walls? Um, I use a lot of different, nothing is off the table in my work. I use quite a few programs. Uh, let Alan, me see what, are you, what, what are some of the programs you, you use? Olga asks, what Well, program? I use, uh, my, I use uh, uh, Elements, mm -hmm. uh, and I use uh, something called Photo Pro for people. I have HDR programs. I use Topaz. I, I use uh, Picasa, the old Picasa. I, I must use 10 different programs to do different things. And sometimes uh, I can't remember the programs, but uh, I'll, I'll show you how I put one together. If, if, let me just move on. But here's another one. Now, this is, this is called waiting. What he's waiting for, I don't have a clue. Uh, I had an old picture of a man playing a piano. All right? So, okay, this is how it works. What can I do with this guy? Play he was playing piano. What can I do with him? So I said, well, okay, let's put him in, you know, we need a little red to, to offset some of, the, some of the black and white. It was an old black and white picture, you can tell, let's see. So I put him waiting, what he's waiting for, I don't know, he's got a, I put a Sunday in there and it's dripping all over the place. <laughs> and I, I, I'm, I have a good time when I'm doing it, by the way. It is sometimes I have a good time. Then I put a clock back there, and, and basically, he's just waiting. I love the way your mind works, Alan. <laughs> the problem is I can't figure it out. Uh, let's go to the, oh, okay. So the main elements, I use my own images, I use vintage images. I use Creative Commons sometimes, clip art. I'm watching television and then something comes up on TV, maybe a two second thing, and that's it. And I take a shot off TV. I, uh, that's about anything. It just, it, you, the thing is about my work, I know it when I see it. So I can't really tell you exactly what it is. Oh, it, it, other is for jokes. Uh, I see work in other museums that go nuts. Uh, 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 David Hockney, I love his work and I try to emulate him sometimes. People watching, that's uh, graphics, cultural aspects. And uh, the last one is my cranium and the unknown, which is basically what a lot of it is. Uh, let me illustrate the process. I don't want to keep you too long. This is how it works. Here's a picture. This actually won at Salma Gundy, the national show. And uh, so I, I thought it was a good one. This is a picture of a man on a pier. How did this image come about? 
That's the question. This is how it came about. Remember the Pierce show down on ninety second. Uh, uh, I think it's a 90, 90 second Pierce or ninety ninety Pierce. This guy was a, a dealer of antique clothing, and I was having lunch, overly expensive, by the way, at that place. And uh, there he was. I said, "That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone who's odd, but yet comfortable." He looked all and comfortable to me. Also at that show was a dollhouse. This is the antique show on the piers, 52nd Street, or 55th Street. This is my brother-in-law's house, at least a pond at his house. He lives up in Walt, New York. Now, I put in ripples, reflections, uh, I, I put the pier in, I put the umbrellas. Let me show you what I put in. If you'll notice, there were three things to begin with, or four things. It was the water, but now you see ripples on the water. You see the house and the, and the shadow, the, the reflection of the house. That was all put in. The pier wasn't there. This umbrella wasn't there. And uh, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things that go into it, but where does the picture come from? This one did itself. This one was between how he looked and the, the uh, Victorian house and the background. This, this picture, this picture drew itself or presented itself. Some not so easy. I just want to say, uh, yeah. uh, Trisha Wright says, love your creative process. And I'll echo that. The fact that you can look at the television while you're working and then incorporate that in, it almost makes you like a beat poet of photography in the way that you're incorporating what's happening. Um, uh, one of the artists points out that you know many of the people or you, you're familiar with them um, and that sort of brings a closeness, um, a connectedness. Um, Ali Berman, cool and quirky, your work makes me happy. Um, <laughs> Fran Beeler, thanks for that great explanation with illustrations and for showing us how you put it all together. Very fun. Um, and Larry, nice, Alan, uh, to see your images again. Uh, Carol Orita, thank you for explaining how you collected the images to reflect your inner world. Very powerful realization of unconscious mechanisms. Very well said, Carol. Um, wrap it up for us, if you like, Alan, so we can move on uh, to Susan. Well, uh, I'm glad that you, that you like it. That's number one. And uh, I just continue. I, 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 enjoy, I, I enjoy doing this. Um, it's, it's really a lot of fun. And I know when I do it, when I do it right, and I find myself laughing and sometimes at my own energy, I said, okay, I got this one right and so on. But again, when I see an image, even if it's a fleeting image on, on TV for a second or two, and I can use it, I'll grab it. And uh, uh, it's an interesting process, but it's it just grows, it just grows. It's, it's really hard to explain, okay? So thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks. Yes. Thanks for the smiles, Alan. What's that? Thanks for the smiles. They made me happy. What's with all the trains in the background? You're you're <laughs> muted. You're muted, Alan. You have to unmute, Alan. I've asked him. I just asked him to unmute. Look at it. What's with the trains? That was that was where I that, that you see that picture over there I'm pointing to? The one up there in the right corner. That's my oh. earlier work. Can you see it? Alan, Alan, did 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 you amuse your audiology patients the same way? I did. I I, I did. You see this book, Painted Memories? Yes. Remember, I was talking about the uh, Irwin House. Is anybody familiar with him? By the way, he was at Parsons. He was a the head of uh, 
he was a wonderful artist and he 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 got me on this trail Alan, was, let me, I mean, let me ask you one question what's the link between the audiology work the trains and your photography if there is one none Okay. <laughs> None. I wanted. I didn't want anything to do with the art world. Having a, a, a freelance artist father who's bitching all the time, and not <laughs> and working like twenty four seven. It was not easy. So I said, "I'm going to get into audiology." Raise your hand when you hear the sound. <laughs> I'm for sure, there is a link between the trains and your photography. <laughs> In the trains, you are playing, you are creating your own micro world, True. Death, you know, so I could see that. The audiology, I don't know where it comes in, and it doesn't mean, <laughs> it doesn't mean there is a link or an answer, but. No, it, the audiology came in because I also have another love, and that's electronics. And I've always been uh, uh, the, the radio electronics nerd. And um, so I, uh, I found myself, um, I don't want to pitch one. I found myself working for the Navy uh, and um, in uh, submarine, submarine sonar at, at one time. And, ah. and it just got me into hearing, and that's how I got it. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all artists start that route. We all start off in the Navy working in subs. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was. It just merged. It was unbelievable. But it got me into audiology and it got me away from art for a long time. But you know about audiology, Alan, you're in a booth and the other person is in a booth, a sound booth. And it's like worlds. It's like these little separate worlds. And some of your stuff, it makes me feel there's a connection in a way. You've created your own worlds, you know? Well, as long as it doesn't go too far, they don't end up in some institution. That's it. <laughs> Alan, very nice. Uh, uh, <laughs> Elaine Forrest says, Alan, you are a collector of happy souls. Very mm -hmm. nice thought. Very well put. Mm -hmm. um, I am going to, uh, and uh, uh, one of the other artists says, it's Pamela. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, she says, Alan, you create your own stages. Um, and San Sandy Cripe, beautiful, very unusual and fun and there's nothing wrong with fun in art fun play beauty those are words that have gotten bad names at different times in the art world but we all know in life they're good names so that may, means they're good names in the art world too um just beware of what some people say but we're all for all that here I do want to move to Susan Tiffin. I want to thank you all for staying. As usual, we're going to run a little over, it, over and we're going to blame Susan for that. Ah, thanks. <laughs> I, I have to say I'm very intimidated after those three presentations. Um, I, uh, whoops, wait a minute. I just lost something here. Oh God, I'm on, I'm on my iPad and my computer. Okay, so let me screen share. I screen share or you? Uh, yeah, no, you could screen share. Okay. And again, everybody, we're here every Monday. Um, we will take a break July 5th. We'll take our July 4th break, so to speak. But otherwise, every Monday, ATOA, uh, look for the link on our website. Reach out to me with any questions about anything. Um, I do want to acknowledge some board members. I see Fran Beeler is here tonight. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm missing any other board members from the Artist Talk on Art. And thank you, Susan, again for organizing and for all of you staying so long. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, I mean, I think I made some great choices and I'm so glad they agreed. Let's see if I can get this to work. Can you, okay, you can see me. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I, I am not as organized as the other presenters. I simply put together things I really like. Uh, I grew up in a house full of art and photographer. My father wanted to be a photographer in his youth. He uh, instead <clears throat> actually, Saul Tiffin founded two different photography companies. 
The first was Entico in 1938 and um, went off to World War II and, and founded Tiffin Optical with two brothers. So that's my background, but I wanted nothing to do with photography. I always had a camera, I was taking snapshots, but I had, I, I wanted to be an artist. So I did not do anything serious with photography. Um, eventually, I, I went to art school, raised a family, um, and eventually was work, well, had a, had a wallpaper store, um, had my own line of designs that sold nationally. Susan, what, art, what art school did you go to? I went to Tyler, which is the art school of Temple University. And I loved it. And I was, um, I was obsessed with ceramics. I was a potter and I was a good potter. But when you um, have two small children and a family and whatever, if you don't have your own studio, you really, you can't continue that. So um, eventually I, I owned a wallpaper store. I had my designs. When the economy changed, I went to work in marketing for telecoms. And lo and behold, I got a digital camera and digital camera and the um, computer, that was it. Photography became my passion, my expression. Um, these are early pictures, the ones that are on the screen now. I fell in love with dahlias. So of course, in my obsessive way, I did a lot of dahlias. These are recent flowers. I love flowers. I, I'm now in a co-op apartment instead of a house and I, I don't have my gardens anymore. So I'm showing you a lot of my flowers. This is a series that was in Photo Photo Gallery. I won a, a group, uh, I, they had a group show and I won a show with Tony Monaco. And um, I love this particular garden and I wanted to give the feeling of a garden. So I printed these and I, well, I didn't print them. I had them printed and I put them in white frames and grouped them because I definitely, you know, I wanted that, that garden feeling. And I don't do black, I was not doing black and white very much, but I think, you know, taking the color out, I, I don't like overly saturated images usually. So, you know, for me, that's, that's my personal taste. And this one on the lower right here is, is the newest version of that garden. And I really like it. So I may go back and rework some of the others. Um, and I've actually ordered, these are anemones. I've actually ordered some plants and hoping I can put them in and uh, the gardeners here won't kill them. This big white dahlia was, was the first flower that I photograph I did, which I absolutely loved. And that really started me in the flowers. Um, I, I joined a, a, a camera club and learned a tremendous amount, a lot about photography. I'm not a technical person. I mean, my father had a, a dark room. I didn't go into it. That was my brother. And, um, you know, so I, I, I've come a long way and I continue to take courses and try and, and grow. Um, these are also, these are new. I do play with textures. Um, I do process a lot. Um, the little begonias in the middle, I love, I just did that. You know, I, I, I don't really travel. I go to Vermont where my younger son and his family live, but I just walk around or go to local places, local parks and take a lot of photographs. Susan, um, where in Vermont do you go to? My, my son and daughter-in-law and granddaughters live in Charlotte, which is right near Lake Champlain, about you know 20 minutes outside of Burlington. And I love it because there's all these falling down buildings. You'll see I have some in here. And it's just, it's a different world up there. It's peaceful, it's quiet, it's serene. You, you drive up there and as you're driving, every lift, Everything lifts, you know, all the, the commotion of Long Island is, is gone. I, I agree with you. I've been to that area. I think it's Route 7 is the main road that goes up there. Yes. Um, there's something in the land there that's quite beautiful. There yes. really is. There's some, some sort of quietness. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we don't get uh, around, you know, the tri-state area. Yeah. Well, and, and my son has pointed out that there are more cows than people and cars up there. So it, it's a different, different effect. And I do play with textures. And lately, uh, I've gone back to, well, I still love dahlias. So these are dahlias with little bees. And again, these are some old photos. I actually was in New York City with a brand new camera and pointed the lens down at a roses in cellophane in a corner bodega. So that's where the roses came from. And I, I did win a prize with that. I do want to read some of the comments. Uh, uh, Trisha Wright says, love these, your lighting, textures, and perspective takes these flowers to a metaphorical level. You really do uh, zoom in. This is very much object photography. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Ali Berman asks, what software do you use? But I'll get back to that. I just want to read, uh, again, this is the artist whose name I'm, I forget. Stunning images really invites us to linger. Um, and Regina Gradis, uh, some really look like paintings. And Daryl Ann Sanders points out, Tiffin filters, yes. I've used them throughout my photo career. Uh, <laughs> Ali Berman also asks, what camera do you use? I do find that an interesting question. It's not a way of saying the camera does the work, but I always like to know. It's just sort of interesting. Um, and uh, Eileen uh, Novak says, you have a terrific photographic eye. So if you don't mind sharing, what software do you like to use? What camera or cameras? Maybe even what lenses? I usually ask that as well. Okay. And uh, Sandy Kreitz says, very talented photographer and wonderful mentor. And obviously organizing this group shows that you're an artist, but you're an artist that can organize artists too. Very important to all the artists. Well, I, I also, I've been me mentoring Sandy in a local camera group and she's doing really well. So I'm thrilled to death. <laughs> um, software, I've, I've been using Photoshop for 20 years. That's what really got me into digital photography. I'm on my fourth or fifth camera. Uh, I have a digital rebel, it's light. I love it. it, it does what I want it to do. I have a Tamron 18 to 270 lens that I love. I use, um, what is it, 18, what is a 55 and a, 35, you know, the kit lenses, really. I, as I've said before, I'm not really te technical. I do have, um, what is it? Uh, I'm going blank, that that lets you do macro. They're little, they're like filters, but you screw them on. Extension tubes or? Extend, well, I guess they're little. Or, they're, or filters, yeah. Yeah, I guess they're a type of filter. And I have no connection to Tiffin anymore. Um, my cousins own it and they're very nice. They give me filters if I call and ask for them. <laughs> and um, I do use Topaz sometimes, um, but Lightroom, Photoshop, Bridge, I'm, I'm very comfortable with it. And 99% and of the time it does what I want it to do. You know, um, I've started taking a class on painting with Photoshop. And I've done some composites, but I, I have a whole new little direction I'm hoping to go in. Susan, um, I, Susan I will say in these two photos, there's something I like, um, you know, in, in your flat florals, very beautiful object center and background, but in mm -hmm. here you use the diagonal in a very strong way. Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's in the bottom right, the train diagonal that, you know, the two point perspective or one point perspective, for the trains and then the stairway going up, the ceiling coming down. So definitely two point. Um, and then the one on the left, again, you're, you're using those diagonals very dramatically. Uh, and even the lights in the top left, the way they go to the vanishing point. Um, mm -hmm. Very beautiful. And obviously different tools you have in your toolbox. Well, you know, going to art school and being forced or, you know, you had to do everything. So you learn about composition. 
you know, you, you learn how to compose something, whether it's a painting or a, a photograph or, you know, positive and negative space stands out in my mind. I heard a lot about that. And um, the, the top left photograph of the woman on the boardwalk, that's what won a prize at Photo Photo Gallery at your best shot. And that's why I had, a, a, I was part of a two person show. So I, when I, when that photograph won, um, Boardwalk Babe, I went into my pictures and I, I pulled out a whole bunch of people. You know, I have a gazillion flowers, but a lot less people. And what's interesting is that this one uh, with the woman walking up the steps, I originally called that, um, what did I call it? Subway, um, Subway Girl, except it's not the subway. It's the Long Island Railroad. So the person who did my printing said, oh, why don't you call it Stalker? Because if you look closely, there is a man there. So it's now called Stalker. But this is the picture that people seem to really react to, which is just kind of interesting, you know. And I can't say when I take a picture that I know what I'm going to have when I'm done. I don't. You know, it's when I open it up in the computer and I say, you know, this is what I want to do. Um, I may crop, I may overshoot, I may change color. Um, you know, I was walking on the street in New York City. That's the man in the doorway. Um, and I'm thrilled to say my grandson loves that. So he's getting that. He took that for his apartment. So I'm delighted. And this, the man on the beach was color. And I, I tried it in black and white and I really like it. So, um, and I'm sure that someday if I go back to therapy, we can discuss why no one is looking at me and there's single people in the pictures. Um, the, <laughs> this man, I didn't know what he was doing. I just thought the texture, the texture of, of the, the boat landing, the, the water, his jacket, I thought it was interesting. And then I realized when I opened it up in the computer, he's washing his shoe. So <laughs> you never know. And this is one of my adored granddaughters. And I love, I love that picture, you know, again, and it's the black, the black and white space, the positive and negative. So, and these are houses that are all around me. Um, old houses. I live in Roslyn Heights. There are a lot of old, old homes here. And these two I see almost every day. And I did use textures and I used effects and that was Photoshop. And I love them. And I did win a little prize with the, the one in the snow. That one's called Winter Came Home Last Night. This was local actually this is this was not far from where tom demick lives they were tearing down the old power plant and i hadn't taken any pictures of it so i ran out in the snow and i took a picture and actually people who are in the area love it because it was very controversial that they were tearing that down and these are you know i like falling apart buildings this is actually the gate at Elderfields, where the Art Guild of Port Washington is home. And that's before they cleaned it up and fixed it up. It doesn't look like this anymore. And this is a photograph I love. I, I also won a prize with this one, but it's interesting because the judge thought I painted in the trees in the back and the mist. I didn't, it was all there. And this is a series that I did. Uh, series of six for a local group that wanted us to do a series and uh, applied the sepia and the edges. I don't really use edges that much, but I, this is a scene from the town of Roslyn. I go past it all the time. Now I take pictures with my phone. This again, no people. <laughs> well, the, the bottom right one is really beautiful and serene. In your you. previous ones of the houses, your houses almost become like people in this one in the bottom right, the bench, the garbage can, the chair that's looking right at us again. And maybe I'm uh, anthropomorphizing them, but they become like people sitting around 
looking mm -hmm. at each other. Right, waiting for the sun to come up or, and this, this one on the left here, I, if anybody knows Cold Spring Harbor on Long Island, I drove by one day and it was completely frozen over and I had never seen that. I mean, I just, it was amazing. And this also was Cold Spring Harbor. And I print law, well, not too large in this day and age, not as large as some, but I, I generally print on matte paper, very heavy GPI. I like a, a painterly quality to it. And this is that same beach that had no people on it because I just love the perspective, you know, the linear quality. And this is Vermont. This is my son's, part of my son's garage. This is Vermont waiting room. More Vermont. Beautiful texture in the image before. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do edit and, uh, and I use my own textures or I try to. And this, this no longer, a lot of these things no longer exist, which kind of fascinates me. You know, this doesn't exist anymore. It's an old building near my kids. Yeah, you know, it brings up the point that, you know, when you take a photograph, you are capturing history. And I hate to say mm -hmm. it, but the, the further history goes on and we're not there, our photographs take on a historical quality and importance because they have captured moments that we think last, but we all know nothing really lasts. Right. Uh, Peggy Pugh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Robin Halpern says, beautiful work, Susan, and you did a great job in your selection of fellow photographers. Peggy Thank Pugh, you. I remember the viaduct, yes, Cold Springs. <laughs> I, I think that's part of it too, as Peggy points out, you bring back our memory of places. You know, we all have seen too much. Our brain though somehow holds it, we just can't recall it. So mm -hmm. when we look at some of these photos, we may bring our own personal associations to it and you may awaken something that's very unique to us, but sort of uh, reawakens our past within us. Well, if you go to Ro the old town of Roslyn now, I mean, they're, they're building these apartment buildings, you know, luxury apartments everywhere. Um, it's really changing. I mean, if the traffic was awful before, I can't imagine what it's gonna be now once everybody's going back to work and all. And this is one of my big favorites. This is the Vermont Lunch Bunch. Yes. That's, I see now this I didn't know I had. I, it's the bottom of a waterfall. And I, I love that one. And I do take people. Um, these are actually two of those girls are my grandchildren. And that's it. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this, although I, I learned a lot about presentations watching the other presentations. I might do it a little differently next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Round of applause, claps and snaps. Thank you. Yay. I will say you mentioned something important there at the end. We learn from each other, whether it's uh, programs you use, cameras you use, uh, what you do, the actual way you put together a work or how you present. We get an opportunity here to see ourselves and it's very, we're artists. We work with images. When we're at something like this, we're asked to talk about the art. And you know, you're right to say, I don't have to say anything. My art speaks for itself, mm -hmm. but we're sort of forced into a verbal skill here. And that is not easy for artists in general. So it, this becomes a good mirror for you to see how other people do and for how you do, and then to marginally change however you feel is right. I will say, Susan, you choosing a diverse group like you did makes sense because when you showed us your work, there's a diverse group of work inside your work. You started with uh, condensed images of flowers, maybe it was dahlias and very object center focus background, you know, just negative space. No, then you had these diagonals with trains and objects. At the end, you had people that were very much people photographs, very nicely done. And you had some landscape shots in there. So you have a wide range within yourself. So maybe that's how it expressed. But either way, I do want to thank you. And of course, all the artists thank and everybody you. here. Uh, 
uh, one of the artists writes, phenomenal jobs of presentations by everyone. Uh, uh, Basha, Ruth Nelson, fabulous program. To your credit, Susan. Um, and I just want to thank you all for coming. Again, we're Artists Talk on Art, uh, atonyc.org. NYC this will be up on our YouTube channel, which you can get to through our website. Our YouTube channel has started to gain some momentum. Our last talk a week ago almost has 100 views already. So people are checking in and seeing. Um, thank you all. Thanks for becoming a part. Spread the word. You know, we grow, we become a, a very large community in a very nice way with many regulars and many new faces. Become a regular, come whenever you like, share your thoughts. Every question asked today was brilliant. It opened up the artists in a way their pre presentation wasn't going to open them up. This is the sort of discourse, the interchange. We become a community and individually be we become more of ourselves. So thank you, everybody. Keep coming. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Barry. It was a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank, wonderful. Thank you, thank presenters. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yet another Bye. great one. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was thank fabulous. You, it was awesome. It was great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. So inspiring. Bye. Thank you.